Hi and welcome. We're so excited that you chose to join us today. And we hope that this message will inspire you to live the life that God designed you to live. For this message or others like it, you can go to our website or you can find us on our YouTube channel. Now sit back, relax, enjoy this message. God wants you to experience the life that He designed. We can't allow life to kill the dream that we dream. Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. You will look back on your life and you'll say, man, life is good. The Word of God brings the abundant life into focus and within your grasp. As you listen, open your heart and discover life.
today, though, I'm going to talk about who God says we are. You know, God says this uh, in Ephesians 2. He invites us to come and sit with Him. That's our place, seated next to God and next to Jesus. And, and I'd like to invite you to see yourself from there today and just listen to who God says you are. I was going to get these scripture verses. Uh, um, uh, Cassie was putting these up. Um, get these in the atmosphere as we started here. Um, and the first one is Isaiah 55 and verse 9. And here God says this. He says, For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And that's up there, you see Isaiah 55, 9. The reason God says that is because He has an open invitation that we would come up to His way of living and His way of thinking. He's not saying that to say, well, He's, he's so far above us. No, He's inviting us to come and live and think like Him. And He has a really good lifestyle. And He invites us to join Him in that. The second verse I'm going to read you, this is what Jesus said to the religious leaders of His day. Now, this is an unfortunate thing that still goes on sometimes. Jesus said, And so you cancel the Word of God in order to hand down your own traditions. This is only one example among many others. He's talking about one thing they were doing. But you know, it's possible for us to think on tradition and put that above the Word of God. People can actually do that in their lives. And so, of course, Jesus is asking us to not do that. Because like I said, God has a really great lifestyle. He's inviting us to live that way with Him. But then here's the answer for that in Romans 12 too. And that's this bottom scripture here. It says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Boy, would you join me in prayer as we get into the Word? We'll just agree together that it'll accomplish what God wants it to do today. Boy, in Jesus' name, we just agree together right now. We thank You, Father God, for Your Word. We're choosing today um, to uh, have You transform our lives by renewing our mind with Your Word. That we will be new people, thinking just like You. And I thank You, You promised Holy Spirit, wherever Your Word was preached, that You would be there. And so we welcome You, and there will be signs following Your Word preached. Thank You for those signs. In Jesus' name, Amen. You know, about 15 years ago now, we poured the foundations for the Destiny Center. And then shortly after, why, we started putting up those cement walls. And, uh, and we, of course, as there had been some years of planning before that. And what, the, and what we thought as a church, we believe, according to Scripture, that every person that's ever been born on the earth, that God has a destiny for that person. A, a good, a, a, uh, a fulfilling, a happy destiny for every person. And God planned that before the foundations of the earth, which means that any one person, and there's been, uh, there's been 14 billion people born on earth, but any one of those persons are more important to God than all of the natural resources of the earth put together. Because it says before the foundation of the earth. So we believe that and we saw at the time, now think this is back almost 20 years ago, that when this planning began, that there was a whole group of teenagers that hadn't been told that. They hadn't been told that God had a destiny for their lives and they were so valuable. And so they didn't see themselves as being valuable and, and there was things going on in our culture that was adverse to their lives that, that were, was hurting them. And so we just felt a mandate from God that we needed a, a center where, where we could tell them about this destiny that God had for them. And so, so we built a destiny center. But just think now, those teenagers are in their 30s and they're having children of their own now and, the, and, and there's still a need to tell people 
and remind people that God has a destiny for them that's more important than all of the earth, the natural resources on the earth. And so, you know, we got so focused on destiny that it just seemed like the right thing to do to change our name from Country Bible Church to Destiny Church because we believe in that plan that God has for everyone's life. And so, of course, we did that a couple of years ago. And, and now this year, man, I'm so excited. I mean, we're, we're making plans to build our public sanctuary over at, at the Destiny Center so we can be right on the freeway and be accessible to everybody. There's, you know, you don't have to find us. We'll be there. And, boy, I couldn't overstate the impact that having the Destiny Center has done uh, in, our, in our area. You see, wherever a church is in an area, they're to be responsible for that region. And the, the responsibility is to bring heaven to earth in that region. To, 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 to bring the good news uh, about how God has this plan for people's lives. And, man, like God says... In Isaiah 55, come on up to my way of living. That's the responsibility of a church. And so, boy, being at the Destiny Center, like just this last week, you know, of course, we have the fitness area and the tanning and people getting ready for summer and getting ready for prom. So there's a lot of activity around. Besides, we've got a lot of, a lot of members of people that come and work out. And this, and this one young mother from town, why she was out tanning with her children, and as she was leaving, why she said to me, Boy, this is such a wonderful service that you provide to the community. And see, that's what it's all about. See, people should see the church as rescuing the culture. Bringing the good things of God into the culture because our culture needs God or it self-destructs. So see, that, that's, what, that's what that place is all about. But, you know, so we've been really focused on destiny uh, for about 20 years. And, and more than that, I mean... Uh, uh, of course, but but I, I've come to this one conclusion that we will never get to that destiny that God planned for each of us before the foundations of the world if we maintain a traditional mindset about who we are. We're going to have to go to God and find out who says we are, who He says we are, if we're going to get to that destination, which is that destiny. It's almost like, well, now we don't use MapQuest so much anymore because People have GPS, but with MapQuest, if you want directions to get to somewhere, you would type in your present address, and then you type in the address where you were looking to go, and then it would direct you, tell you, you know, turn here after so many miles and like that. But if you don't know your current address, why? And and um, and if you think traditionally and not like God, what God says, your destiny will always be smaller in your mind than what God has. Because he thinks a lot more highly of ourself than, uh, than religion and Christianity has told us. And, and I'm going to show you that from his word today. So if we ever expect to get to this destiny, that, that it, it, uh, you know, uh, down on Romans 12 too, the good at God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect, to get there, we need to know who God says we are now. Because we just can't get there from here. If here isn't who God says we are. Does that make sense, everybody? And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start right at the beginning and tell you who God says that we are. And one point I'm going to really make strong is that we were made to be just like God. But first, to, so I want to tell you about something about God first, about who He is. You know, we sing songs today about the great love that God has for us. And boy, that's very true. But you know, it's even more than that. God doesn't just love you and me. He actually is love. In fact, the definition for God is love. And the definition for love is God. And uh, boy, let me read you a familiar piece of Scripture. And, and, and I'm going to interchange those words because God is love. And, and so I'm reading in John 1, and I'll read John 1 uh, w- verse 1 through 3. <clears throat> Excuse me. Before anything else existed, there was Christ with God. So, see, I'm going to change that word. Before anything else existed, there was Christ with love. He has always been alive and is Himself love. Love created everything there is. Nothing exists 
that love didn't make. And, and that's who God is. And, you know, so many times, I just think of this in my own life, and, boy, you know, I, I've, I started out in evangelical Christianity when I, it was like when I was born. The first words I remember saying was asking Jesus to come into my heart. And, boy, as I, I was growing up, we'd memorize all these Scripture verses. We'd even be on these quiz teams where we'd memorize verses and we'd rattle them off, you know. One person would start out and you'd talk as fast as you could because you were in a, in a competition. But, you know, the God that I knew I was afraid of because we were taught to fear God. And the God that I knew was mad. And, uh, and so I always looked at God like he's mad at me. And, and so, so uh, man, we thought then that being God was mad at us. He must be mad at everybody. And so we should be mad at them too. And boy, that made them mad at us. Uh, and, and, and we thought that was a good thing when, when we make people mad in the community. But see, it's just the opposite. If anybody tells you about God and the, the, the bottom line isn't love, the foundation isn't love, why, they're talking about a different God. Because God is love. And love is God. So with that in mind, let me start right here in Genesis chapter 1. And it'll be, it'll get to be apparent why I'm starting right at the beginning like this. But uh, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, When God began creating the heavens and earth, the earth was at first a shapeless, chaotic mass with the Spirit of God brooding over the dark vapors. Verse 3, then God said, let there be light, and light appeared. Now, that's important. In the Hebrew, which this is originally written in, why God said, light be, and light came out of God and destroyed the darkness that was on the earth. The light was the light that came out of God. It was the glory of God that came out and destroyed darkness. It wasn't the sun and the moon because they were made on the fourth day. But this light came out of God when he said, light be, and darkness was destroyed. So I'm going to take you over here to when God made man. In in Genesis 1 and verse 26, it says this. I'm going to read verse 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make a man, someone like ourselves, to be the master of all life upon the earth and in the skies and in the seas. So God made man like his maker. Like God, did God make man. Man and maid, did he make them. Four times in those two scripture verses, it said that God made man to be just like himself. In fact, you know, man was made to be God's family. The word, the word Adam in Hebrew just means man. And we were made to be a family for God. So we were made just like Him. And, and if, if you can imagine, of course, this whole world and man had first started as a dream in God's innermost being. And now He was speaking it out as He was creating. But, you know, you know there's about a trillion angels here. And I want you to think about that. If there's 14 billion people that have lived on earth and every person has had at least one angel, a personal angel, and probably two, and then there's armies of angels and there's messenger angels and there's worshiping angels, well, there's about a trillion angels and every one of those angels, their whole purpose in life is to minister to you and I as the heirs of salvation. So they had knowing about this dream in God's heart. So think what this looked like to them when they were watching God create His family. You see, angels, they aren't made like God. They, they do what God tells them to do. They do what the Word of God tells them to do. God has a freedom of choice. He chooses. And we were made like Him. And so when they saw this happen, think what that must have looked like. In fact, let me read this to you in Genesis 2 And verse 7, this gives a more detailed account of creating man. It says, The time came when the Lord God formed a man's body from the dust of the ground. Okay, let me stop there. Don't ever let somebody tell you that you were made like from dust or dirt, and like so you're dirt. What's in the ground is the life of God. You know, in about two weeks from now, 
why there's going to be farmers all around us and, the, and every one of those farmers will plant millions of seeds in the ground. And they have no idea what makes this happen, but somehow or another, when a seed goes in the ground, it, it comes alive. It makes a sprout and it grows a plant that multiplies those seeds. The life of God is in the ground. So God formed man from this life in the ground. And here it says, he, and breathed the breath of life. And man became a living person. In the Hebrew, which this is originally writing in, why God said to Adam, life be. And life came out of God and went into Adam. Just think, all these angels watching this, and God formed this body, and He held Adam up face to face, and he looked just exactly like God. And when he spoke, life be, the glory and the light and the life of God came out of him and went into Adam. And I'm convinced the angels couldn't tell which one was God and which one was Adam. That is our foundation here. And, uh, I mean, what a sight. And because it said, you know, Adam was clothed in the glory of God. So he looked just like God, this bright, shining light. And then the next thing God did, and, 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 and he, this, is, this is the good news of the Bible. It says, and God blessed them. When God blessed them, he's, the power that was in God came out of him and went into Adam. And what that power was to be used for was to multiply and fill the earth and subdue it you are masters of the fish and birds and all the animals. God made man to be God on earth. And God gave the earth to Adam. There was only one thing on earth that belonged to God, and that was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He actually gave the earth to Adam. And God's plan for this, now it's clear, He put Adam in this perfect place, the Garden of Eden. And the Garden of Eden is in where modern-day Iraq would be today. Man, if you see pictures on television of Iraq, why, you know, we've come a long way. (laughs) Because it it doesn't look like the Garden of Eden at all. But that's where the Garden of Eden was. You know by where the rivers were. And then the circumference of the Garden of Eden was about the size of Iraq. And God intended for Adam to co-create the rest of the world into the Garden of Eden. And immediately, that's the first thing Adam did, was name all the animals. And whatever name gave, Adam gave to the animals, and he did that, they took on that nature. The, the nature was in the name. See, names don't mean too much to us in America, but, boy, in, uh, in, to Hebrew, uh, in the Hebrew, and, uh, the names was, were the nature. And so Adam named these animals and decided what they would be by giving them that name. He immediately started to co-create. That's the foundation. God gave Adam, he made him just like him. He gave him a total freedom of choice. And so God put his tree in the garden and right next to it was the tree of life. But you know the story. When, when all those trillions of angels were watching Adam get, get created to be just like God, Satan was watching too. Uh, and and he, when he fell out of heaven, he took a third of the angels with him. And that was before this time. He was watching. And what, what Satan had always wanted was what Adam had. To be just like God. And to have that blessing, that power. God blessed them. That was the power Adam was to use to have dominion on the earth. And so, so Satan, he came up with a plan to convince Adam to give him that power that he'd always wanted. And that's what happened when, when Adam ate, stole from God on his tree. In effect, what he was doing was saying, well, I don't want to co-create with you, God. I'm going to co-create with Satan. And then he gave that blessing, to, gave authority to Satan that's what Satan had always wanted, but he got a big surprise. He thought that, that he could have the blessing, but when it got into his hands, it turned into the curse. Because everything he touches dies. And so, so I, mean, that, that's where, I mean, that's where you know that's how sin got into the earth. And Adam's nature changed. He actually, he actually died spiritually when he did that. 
But you know, that, that was no surprise to God. Before the foundation of the earth, God planned that Jesus would die with all of these sins on him and ra- raise again from the dead, getting victory over Satan and getting that authority, that blessing back. So sin was not a surprise to God. He knew all that, but it was so important that Adam would be just like him that he gave him freedom of choice anyhow. And, and, and so, so then, from that time on, why, then God was looking to bring Jesus to earth. It took almost 4,000 years to get that to happen. One whole world self-destructed before that happened. But God found a man to make covenant with. That was Abraham. The covenant God had with Abraham is that Abraham would sacrifice his beloved only son. So then forever settled, God would send Jesus, would sacrifice his son. See, that's the way a covenant worked. And God couldn't just send Jesus. He had to find a man. And it took, boy, it took about 2,500 years before he could find that man that he could make covenant with. He had tried with others, but that was with Abraham. And that is the covenant today. Praise God, if you're born again today, that's the covenant with God that you are under. Abraham made the, the sacrifice for that covenant, and we reap the rewards of it. That's why it says in Galatians 3, 13 and 14 that we have been redeemed from the curse and we've been released to the blessing of Abraham. And the blessing of Abraham is right what God said to Adam. God blessed him. That's that blessing empowered, empowered to rule on earth, to have dominion on earth. That's the, that's the blessing that we received once you receive Jesus. Jesus is called the Redeemer. You know what it means to redeem? It means to bring back the same as where, what it started. It's like if I was going to redeem a piece of furniture. I mean, maybe it had set out in the rain and, and, and maybe it had fallen into some disrepair. If I was going to redeem it, boy, I, I, I'm not much of a woodworker, but I, I, I'd sand that down and stain it and, and, and replace any, uh, any broken parts. And when it got done, it would look just like new. In fact, it might even look better. When we say that Jesus redeemed us, that means He brought us right back to where Adam started. Do you believe that? Made just like God? See, Jesus, He is called the second Adam. And He's actually a new species of being. He, he was God but He chose to become a man and He died with all of our sins on Him, paying the price. He went to hell, paying the price for our sins and He rose from the dead, totally defeating Satan and bringing, getting back the authority that Adam had given to Satan. And, and He says this, uh, let me show you this in Matthew 28. That, that's what this means. As Jesus ascends to heaven, he told, he told His disciples in verse 18, I have been given all authority in heaven and earth, therefore go with that authority. See, He gave that authority right back to us. So, when you got born again, and you know the invitation's out. If you're here and you're not born again today, don't leave here without being born again because I, I'm, I'm going to show you how wonderful it is here in 2 Corinthians um, 5, I'll start with verse 17. It says here, When someone becomes a Christian, he becomes a brand new person inside. He is not the same anymore. A new life has begun. In, in one translation, it says, He becomes a new species. And, and, and He does. That's what Jesus did. Jesus became a new species. Do you know that when Jesus, it says he, when He rose again, He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He's not seated there as God. He's seated there as a recreated man, a new species of man. Because after He rose again from the dead, why, He stayed on the earth for about 40 days. And His body was, man, He could eat, you could touch His body, and yet He could go right through walls. That's what we became. When we are in Christ, we became a new species. 
we became just like Jesus. He's the, he's, that's why he's called the second Adam. And now we're, we're his, his, uh, his brothers, his sisters, his descendants even. A new life has begun. The old life is gone. Your old life, when you got born again, your old life died. And the fear of death is gone because you did all the dying you're going to do. You never die when you leave this body. You, you just translate it to heaven to be with God. See, and, and you, know, you know, Paul said this. He, he's talking to the church in Corinth. And Paul, before he was saved, why, what, what, he did, uh, what he did for an occupation was, was run around and hunt Christians down and get them arrested and get them killed. So that wasn't a real good occupation, especially when he's talking to Christians. And, and Paul said this. He said, I've harmed no man. I've done no man any wrong. He was talking to people that some of their family members he had had killed. But see, that person that had done that was dead. Paul had became a new creation, a new species. Man, that, that is, uh, And then in verse 18 it says, All these new things are from God, who brought us back to Himself through what Christ Jesus did. See, it, once you are in Christ, you're brought back to God. Remember in the Garden of Eden when, when Adam sinned and he went and hid from God. He separated himself from God. But when you are in Christ, you're brought back to God. There's no reason to go and hide anymore. It says, and God has given us the privilege of urging everyone to come into His favor and be reconciled to Him. You are in God's... God is predisposed with favor towards you today. For, to everyone. And He wants us and Him to be totally reconciled. That means we're, we're back, right back the same as He was with Adam. He come down and talk to Him face to face. 19. For God was in Christ restoring the world to Himself no longer counting men's sins against them, but blotting them out. Boy, you know, I've been saved a long time and I spent so many years wasting my time thinking about sin when God had already blotted all them sins out. When Jesus took sin on Himself, it was past, present, and future. God don't even think about sin anymore. He thinks about reconciliation. There's only one sin that you can commit today that will send you to hell. And that's if you reject Jesus Christ. Reject what He's done for you. This is the wonderful message He has given us to tell others. We are Christ's ambassadors. God is using us to speak to you. We beg you, as though Christ Himself were here pleading with you, receive the love He offers you. Be reconciled to God. You know, I've known a lot of Christians in my life and even though they're born again, they need to hear that message. That now they are reconciled with God. God isn't holding their sins against them. He's predisposed towards favor for everyone that's born again. I mean, you know what's it's so hard for us to receive that sometimes because it's just above what we can think or imagine. But yet that's that's the message. That's the message. And until you receive that message, you, you, you'll never be who God says you are, who God made you to be, because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And then when you look at your life and the future, you'll always think smaller. You'll always think smaller. But here we've been reconciled to God. We're a new species of the species of Jesus and we are actually seated, God says, our position is right next to Him in heaven. Right now. Right now. And nothing will take that position away. Praise God. Because it goes on here. For God took the sinless Christ, verse 21 of 2 Corinthians 5, and poured into Him our sins. Then in exchange, He poured God's goodness into us. You, you are an embodiment of God's goodness today if you're born again. And, then, and everybody can be born again. So the invitation's open, but you are... He, it says right there, we embody 
the goodness of God. Praise God. You know, we celebrated Easter last week. And that's what it's all about. You know, when Jesus rose from the dead, it says in the Gospels that, well, of course, when He, he rose out of hell, he, he spoiled principalities and powers, which made, He just humiliated Satan. And it talks, in, and over here, there, there's this grandstand of, of, uh, of the saints of old that watch these things from heaven it talks about in Hebrews 12. And man, they was all watching him, cheering him on as he was taking back everything that Satan had stolen over 4,000 years of human history. And then he came up and he took all those Old Testament saints up to heaven with him. And you know what it says on earth is that some of them who were buried in Jerusalem, they got up and the people saw him for all those 40 days. They went and told people about it in Jerusalem, what they had saw about Jesus defeating Satan. I mean, this is that real. And then the next thing Jesus told them, of course, what, 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 this, what this is meant to do, we're, if we're just like Adam again, then we're to expand the Garden of Eden. The, the, the purpose for Adam was to have children and then, as he got more children, why that garden would grow and grow till it covered the whole earth. And then, once we got to the ends of the earth, where there's all these planets around that are in, uninhabited right now, and they need to be brought into a place like the Garden of Eden too. So that's what we're to do. Now, that's what Jesus told his disciples: "Take my authority." He said that in Matthew. He said, "Use my authority in Mark." He said to to, to heal people and to cast out devils and to speak in new tongues. Um, and, then, and then in Acts, why he had told them to go and wait in Jerusalem till the Holy Spirit came and, and then they would receive power. They would see, receive power to be witnesses. And I want to take you over to the second chapter of Acts and show you what that looked like because what I'm showing you here is a look just like Adam again. In the second chapter of Acts, there were 120 of these folks, uh, of these folks that were praying together here, I've got to take my jacket off. It's getting exciting in this part right here. Um, so, Okay, thanks. So, so, so there was 120 of these people praying, and then that happened. The Holy Spirit came. But look at here in Acts 2. Um, I'll start with verse 2. It says, Suddenly there was a sound like the roaring of a mighty windstorm in the skies above them, and it filled the house where they were meeting. You know what that wind was? It was a trillion angels that moved to earth. See, once the curse was on earth, there were no heirs of salvation for them to minister to, so they, they, had, to, they, went, they had to stay in heaven. You know, they'd come down on ladders or they'd come as messengers, fight their way through in the Old Testament. But now, Satan had no right on earth, so they, they filled the earth. That was that wind. About, think of the spiritual activity. All the heirs of salvation at that time were right there in Jerusalem. They all showed up at one place and, and man, it was like a tornado come through the building. But then look at the next thing it says. Then what looked like flames of fire appeared and settled on them. That was the 120. You know what that flame was? That was the glory of God. Just like when God uh, spoke life into Adam and His glory went into him. It happened again. The glory of God went on these people and, and, and what it looked like was a fire. That's how they described light. They didn't, have, they didn't turn on a light bulb. They lit a, a lantern or a lamp and it was fire. And, and when you read on, you know, when it talks about Peter walking down the street and his shadow would fall on people and they get healed, what that was was the glory of God. As big around him as the shadow would be, his, that glory was on him, and anybody that come in contact with it was healed. That's just as real today as it was then. The only difference is, is Mark seven thirteen. We've canceled the word of God to a degree by our by our traditions, because religion has see. Love never controls. Love gives free choice. God made Adam to have free choice. Religion is there to manipulate, to control. Religion says, well, man, if we just let these people go, they're going to sin. 
uh, uh, if we give them free choice, we'll give them a license to sin. Well, man, that, that's, it doesn't matter. People have been sinning without a license for many years. It, 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 you might as well have a license. Um, but that, that, see, that's what love does. That's what, it, but, but religion has got to have this degree of control so you can't tell somebody, man, you're made just like God. And God empowered you to rule on this earth. And to, and to expand the Garden of Eden on this earth, to, to actually, that, that, man, you know, just think Jesus, Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. We even have control to a degree of heaven. That, God entrusted us with that. And see, if we're ever going to get to where God, to the destination where God wants us to be, we're going to have to get these truths inside of us. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. See, if, if we keep thinking with the traditions of man, if we keep copying the behavior and customs of this world, why, we'll live and die in this area, and we'll have a church of about 200, and we'll have a, just a limited uh, influence around us when we could rule it all. We could bring the kingdom of heaven to Grant County, to Douglas County, and to Ottertail County, because that's what God wants. And, and I think I'm talking to the right people today. People that realize that you are a new species, a new creation, that God has spoken His glory into you today, just the same as He did to Adam, just the same with Jesus, that you are that kind of species of people. Well, well, let me show you another place in Scripture that just reaffirms this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I'll start with verse 14. Paul is writing this to the church in Corinth and he says, But the man who isn't a Christian can't understand and can't accept these thoughts from God, which the Holy Spirit teaches us. They sound foolish to him. Because only those who have the Holy Spirit within them can understand what the Holy Spirit means. Others just can't take it in. But, verse 15 says, the spiritual man, that's the born again man. That's this new creation, uh, this new species, just like Jesus. The spiritual man has insight into everything and that bothers and baffles the man of the world who can't understand him at all. How could he? For he has never been one to know the Lord's thoughts or to discuss them with him or move the hands of God by prayer. So today, if you're a spiritual man, a spiritual woman, you've been born again. You are a new species. You've been reconciled to God. God's favor is on you. You actually have the Lord's thoughts. And, he, and you can discuss them with him. Just think. When God came down to earth, he, to, he, He's going to do some stuff on earth, and He stopped by Abraham's tent. And as He, he, had, he had some dinner with Abraham, and as He was leaving, why, He had two angels with Him. And God says, boy, this thing we're doing on earth, we can't do this without first checking it out with Abraham and see what he thinks. That's your, my goodness, that's our place. God checks with us. What's going to happen on our planet here? Yeah, wow, that's right. Or to move the hands of God in, by prayer. We actually, we actually talk to God about what He's going to do. Move the hands of God by prayer. God made us to be co-creators, just like Adam. Boy, if you're not just like what Adam was in the Garden of Eden today, why... Man, it's time to come on up to God's way of thinking. Come on up to God's way of living. Because look, I'll finish this verse 16. But strange as it seems, we Christians actually do have within us the very mind of Christ. <laughs> what could you do today if you had the mind of Christ? With those bills you're dealing with, today, wringing your hands about, would they be such a big deal if you have the mind of Christ? If you got a bad report from the doctor today that said that your health was failing, would that mean so much to you once you had the mind of Christ? 
Well, how about if you had, you know, if you had kids right now that were away from God, and, but you could move the hands of God in prayer, discuss with God about what He's going to do. You got the mind of Christ. Would that be a great concern to you? Or would you say, man, thank God, it's done. I've, I've already been healed. My needs, uh, my, my wants have already been met. Glory be to God. I have the mind of Christ. The creative. The creative mind of Christ. Now, what could you invent, Matt, today if you had the mind of Christ? What could you build, Jason, if you had the mind of Christ? Well, what kind of church could you build out of the out of young men and women, Jeremy, if you had the mind of Christ with sub-30? Well, you do. You got it today. You got it. We got to quit going after it and stand on the fact we have it. Then we can sit right here with God and receive everything we need to turn the place we're living into the Garden of Eden. Right here. God wants our days on earth to be just as those in heaven because He made us in the status that He is in. Oh, it's tragic for a human being to live any less than what God lives today. Because we were made to live just like Him in His lifestyle. And, you know, and if all this isn't taking a hold right now, that's okay. Just meditate on it during the week. Uh, go back to some of these scriptures and, and, and read them. And, and, but read, read them out of a Bible in your language, uh, not King James language or something, but, but read them in a thing you can understand and meditate on that. And you'll see that's what it's all about. You know, God had waited 4,000 years to embrace people again because He had to hide His glory. Because wherever His glory was, it destroyed sin. And, and, and if people uh, had a sin nature, then they got destroyed. That, that's why when Moses was up on Mount Sinai, he told God, I want to see your glory. And God said, well, man, we can't do that, but uh, you can kind of see a glimpse of my backside. I mean, what a tragic thing for a God that wanted a family. But when Jesus rose from the dead and created this new species of people, He can embrace us face to face with His glory today. We're, we're not Moses. We're, we're, we're not. We, we are a new species of people on earth when you're born again today. Boy, and we need to catch that. Because look, here, I'll, I'll, I'll go back. I'll, I'm going to close where I started in, in, in Isaiah 55. And um, I'll start with verse 10. As the rain and snow come down from heaven and stay upon the ground to water the earth and cause the grain to grow and to produce seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry, so also is my word. I send it out. How does God's word get sent out on earth? Through us. We're carriers, not just of the glory of God, but of the word of God. We can speak God's word, and it's just as powerful when we speak it as when God spoke it after He put His power inside of us. You're born again today. The Holy Spirit of God inhabits your spirit man. So also is My Word. I send it out and it always produces fruit. It shall accomplish all I want it to and prosper everywhere I send it. You will live in joy and peace. The mountains and hills and trees of the field, all the world around you will rejoice. Where once were thorns, fir trees will grow. Where briars grew, the myrtle trees will sprout up. This miracle will make the Lord's name very great and be an everlasting sign of God's power and love. Everywhere we speak God's Word starts to turn into the Garden of Eden. If I was talking about our region that we're responsible for right here around us today, Grant County, Ottertail County, Douglas County, the region around us, it would read something like this. Where people were getting divorced, now they don't do that no more. Now they have happy families. There's joy in the family. Where people were abusing their children, once the word gets sent out, that doesn't happen anymore. 
children get raised in loving homes where they get value and they know they have people that love them. Where people were poor and not able to pay their bills. That doesn't happen anymore. Now, my God meets all my wants and needs according to His glorious riches in Christ Jesus. That's what happens. See, where people, where, where young men and women were directionless all at once, they see who they are and who God has made them to be, and then they be. That's what happens when God's Word gets sent out by this new species of people, which is you and me. Where people took meth and were addicted to, to, uh, to very harmful drugs. Hey, that don't happen anymore. They're, they're happy enough without those drugs. No, they got joy. Where, where, where people spend all their money on, 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 on alcohol and, 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 and uh, now they don't, they don't need that anymore because they're so happy without it. That's what happens. That where, where that word gets sent out by this new species of people, it turns into the Garden of Eden. And God's plan is that that would expand, that His glory would cover the entire earth. That's what He wants to do at this time. That's why when He talks about a glorious church without spot or wrinkle and, and a time when His glory will cover the entire earth, that's you and me and that's today. So that's why it's so important that we see ourselves as who God says we are. Then, then we can do these things. If we keep seeing ourselves as small and inadequate and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, without favor from God, that will never happen. But once we receive who God says we are, oh man, that's the purpose. That's the purpose here. And that's the... Boy, that's great news, isn't it? That's great news. Well, that was, uh, well, that was the message. I'm going to turn this over to Linda to close the service today. And I want you to know that He can give you today a new future. We hope this message has been a blessing to your life. A copy of this message and additional Destiny Church materials are available at destinychurchexit77.org. 